forth with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty high silver, the Lone Ranger. led the fight for law and order in the early western United States. Nowhere in the pages of history can one find a greater champion of justice. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse, Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. Oh, Silver! Fourteen-year-old nephew Dan Reed stood beside the Furnace River. Several miles below them, the Modoc Irrigation Dam, a new project, was in operation, backing up the flood-swollen river until it formed a long lake. The masked man had drawn one of his six guns. He was saying, "Dan, it's time you learned something about marksmanship." Are you really going to let me shoot that gun? Yes, but first I want to fix it in your mind that no gun is a plaything. The deadly weapon, which must always be handled with care. I know how careful you are, sir. Now, never draw a gun unless you're prepared to use it. Never point at anything you wouldn't want to shoot. Never shoot unless you have no other choice. Now, take the gun. Gee, gosh, but it's heavy. What shall I shoot at? There are a lot of logs in the river. So many, in fact, that I wonder where they come from. Fire at that one out there. I'll have to use both hands to cock it. One of the arms companies is now putting out a self-cocking gun. It's called a double action 38. Pull on the trigger, throws back the hammer, and trips it. There, I've got it cocked. Are you ready? Already. Here goes. Oh, I, I shot way over oh, it. The barrel kicked up. I'm going to shoot again. That was better, but you still missed it by a yard. Don't make your trigger finger do all the work. Use your whole hand and squeeze both butt and trigger. I'll try again. I hit it! I hit it! I saw the bark fly! That was good, Dan. You're letting fast. The time will come when you'll feel that a gun is part of your hand. The log's gone now, but there comes a small chunk. It's only a few feet out. I'll try for it. Oh, wait. Don't shoot, Dan. Put that hammer down gently. Now it's down. What's wrong, sir? That's not a piece of wood. The canteen. I'll wait in after it. Can you reach it? Yes, I've got it. It's almost new. Where do you suppose it floated from? I have no idea, but there's something inside. Here, listen. Maybe there's some gold nuggets in it. <laughs> I'll let your imagination run away with you, Dan. There, I've got the cap off. Now I'll pour out whatever's inside. What are those things? Those pebbles like we're standing on. I wonder. Yes, there's something else in it. A rolled paper. Somebody wanted this canteen found and opened. 
The pebbles were intended to arouse the finder's curiosity. I'll bet that paper is a mess. We'll know in a moment. The paper is wet, and I don't want to damage it. Uh, there's some writing on it. It's smudged, but I'll try to read it. If this letter is ever found, it is the wish of a dying man that it be delivered to Mrs. Ellen Norwood in Modoc City. My dear wife and darling daughter. Are you going to read the rest? I don't like to, but the writing may disappear or the paper fall apart. We should know the contents. That's what I think, sir. And the letter goes on. Jim Stark and I were ambushed the 27th of May on the Furnace River near Squaw Creek. Jim was killed. I was shot in the back and left for dead. When I came to, I was paralyzed from the waist down. The horses are gone. I can't live much longer. Tell the sheriff that... Tell him what? That's the end of the letter. Either the writer couldn't go on, or the writing has faded out. Do you suppose there's a chance of finding the man alive? He must be presumed dead. The 27th was three weeks ago. No badly wounded man could live that long without food, shelter, or medical attention. Come on back to camp. I see Tonto waiting for us. We're up, ready. I haven't time to eat now, Tonto. Here, Silver. Where you go, Kim Sabi? To Modoc City to deliver a letter. Dan will explain. Steady, Silver. Come on, Silver. <laughs> That evening, two ranchers leaned against an isolated hitch rack in Modoc City. They were Tim Higgins and Leif Hayes, both from the lower valley of the Furnace River. Keeping a sharp watch around them, they talked in low voices. Hayes was saying, Tim, I wish you hadn't a plug nor wooden stock. Me pulling the trigger on them doesn't let you out. You were there helping me roll logs into the river to wreck their irrigation dam. And I was there again today, and the bodies are gone. Yeah, what of it? The high water probably carried them off. And they'll turn up sooner or later. Well, we should have buried them. Wasn't time for that. With Indians always prowling around those parts. But suppose those fellas are found. And it comes out that they were drilled with thirty-eight caliber slugs. That new double-action gun of yours is the only thirty-eight around, and everybody knows it. Sheriff's too dumb to think about the size of the bullets. Yeah. Well, he's not too dumb to know that you and I and all the other ranchers in the lower valley had it in for Norwood because he was superintendent of the irrigation dam. And for Stark because he was Norwood's helper. Why shouldn't we have had it in for them? Unless we get rid of that confounded dam, the lower valley will be full of ditches and two-bit homesteaders in a few months. They'll be growing onions where we're running longhorns now. The dam is still standing. All those logs we sent drifting down against it never hurt it a bit. Uh, I figured that they'd plug the spillways and that the whole thing would give way or wash out during high water. Uh, you better figure out now a way of keeping us from being charged with murder. You better figure right. I hear Norwood's woman is pestering the sheriff to look for him in Stark. Well, maybe the Indians will get the blame. Hey, wait a minute. You're a friend of the sheriff's. Why don't you start him thinking about redskins? Yeah. I'll go and talk to him right now. See you later, Lane. A few minutes later, Higgins was in the jail office with Sheriff Ben Robbins. There was a thoughtful look on the grizzled lawman's face as he said, Higgins, you are the first fella who's complained about the Indians in a long spell. I tell you, they rustled at least 50 head of cattle from a herd I had running on the high range. <laughs> well, I'll get me a posse and have a look around Chief Longlance's village. I can be looking for Dick Norwood and Jim Stark along the way. Uh, Norwood and Stark? Yeah. Uh, there's Mrs. Norwood now. Howdy, ma'am. This here is Tim Higgins. Oh, how do you do? How do you do? Have you heard from your husband yet? I, I just received a message from him. Oh, I'm right glad to hear that. Sheriff, you don't understand. He, he's dead. Yeah. You take this chair, ma'am. You're kind of beside yourself. Thank you, Sheriff. They dead. Now, look here. How could he be dead if you got word from him? Here's his letter. Yeah. It'll tell you. Yeah, it's kind of smudged, but I can read it. Say, Tim, may pour the lady some water. Yeah? Sure, sure. Here you are. Oh, thank you. Sheriff, you look mighty puzzled. What's in that letter? It appears like no wooden stark got bushwhacked up by Squaw Creek. But no would live long enough to write a few lines. Well, I don't see how... How what? 
how the letter got here. It floated down the river in my husband's canteen. Well, did he say who shot him? No. Nope. But I reckon he knew who did. The letter breaks off right where he was going to tell. Oh, that's too bad. Now, Mammy, do you feel up to answering some questions? I try. How come your husband and Stark went up the river when it's their business to look after the dam? They wanted to find out why so many logs drifted down against the dam. Did he uh, suspicion that somebody put them in the river to wreck it? I don't know. Tim, do you know anything about it? What? Are you accusing me? No, no. But you Valley ranchers fought hard against that dam being built. We did our fight in court. And when we got licked, we gave up. Even though it meant losing our holdings. Who else would want to smash the dam? What about the engines? It backed water up on their land and made them move their village. See, that's all. And come to think of it, engines have been known to smash bridges by floating logs against them in flood time. But, Sheriff, my husband liked the Indians and they liked him. Why, why they called him Big Beaver because of the dam. The engine never drew breath at like a white man. Oh, but... Now, what's more, the bushwhacking took place right near Long Lance's village. Yep, yep, Tim's right, Mrs. Norwood. Everything points to the Indians. Oh. Now, it, who was it brought in this here canteen? Why, a man who wore a mask. A mask? And he had the nerve to come right into town? He appeared at my home just after dark. He was very sympathetic and promised to help see that justice is done. He did, eh? Where'd he go? I don't know. But what difference does it make? He certainly didn't kill Dick and Jim. No, I reckon not. But if I I him, want the killers caught. Well, we'll get them. Tomorrow morning, I'll call in every fellow around who can ride and shoot. Then we'll go after the engines. Meanwhile, the Lone Ranger had stood outside the window of the jail office, listening to all that was said. As Mrs. Norwood left, he hurried to a nearby alley where he had left Silver mounted and rode hard to camp. There he reported what he had heard to Toto and Dan. Toto shook his head. Indians not kill them men, Kimasabi. Norwood never lived to write letter if Indians shoot him. Mrs. Norwood said he was friendly with Long Lance and his people. Look like Higgins, fella. Try to cover up for cattlemen. You bear watching. We have no time for that now. Long Lance and his whole tribe are in danger. Why you say that? Well, the sheriff is a good man, but he won't be able to control the kind of mob he plans to lead against the Indians. We don't want American civilization disgraced by another Sand Creek massacre. Ah. Then what we do? We'll go to Long Lance's village and have a talk with him. On the way, we'll look for the scene of the shooting. May I go with you? No, Dan. I want you to go to Modoc City and stay at the hotel. Yes, sir. Hollow will call for you later. Well, be, be ready, Kimasabi. Easy, steady, big fella. Adios, Dan. Adios, Dan. Adios, Dan. It was late the next morning when the masked man and Toto reached the vicinity of Long Lance's village. They rode slowly, examining the banks of the river for a considerable distance, then drew rain. I know there's nothing around here that tells what happened. Even the bodies are gone. Ah. And me not savvy that. The killers may have returned and disposed of them. Well, here, Indian Trail. It's plenty used. I could lead the village. All right, we'll follow it. Come on, Silver. Get him up. Stop. The curtain falls on the first act of our Lone Ranger adventure. Before the next exciting scenes, please permit us to pause for just a few moments.
to continue. The trail soon took the Lone Ranger and Toto into a valley where the village stood. As they neared the large circle of teepees from the east, knowing that the entrance would open toward the rising sun, Toto's eyes narrowed. Something wrong here, Kimasabi. Nobody around. The village has been warned of our approach. Maps on teepee all down. That's not good. One is opening. The chief and a medicine man are coming out in ceremonial dress. Too late to leave. We'll make the peace sign and act as though we hadn't noticed anything unusual. We better stick close to horses. We shall. Pull up and we'll dismount. Close to the road. Easy, fella. Salute the chief in his own tongue, Tonto. City boy. Wama. Close on me. Wama. Now, we tell him we friends. Him offer double handshake with crossed arms. Not like that. The highest Indian honor. It would be dangerous to refuse it. Give the medicine man your hand, and I'll give mine to the chief. As the forearms crossed and the four hands met, the Lone Ranger and Toto felt the fingers of Long Lance and the medicine man tighten into wrestlers' holes. Before they could break the grips, the chief yelled an order. Oh, my God, kick it! Out of the teepee, swarmed scores of warriors. The masked man and Toto went down under a tangle of bronze bodies, using their weapons for clawing hands. They fought desperately, but were soon exhausted in the struggle. Panting from the unequal fight, the Lone Ranger and Toto were pulled to their feet and firmly held, while Long Lance spoke. Hey, Buna. Mano Kila. You know what he said, Toto? Uh, him tell men, take your mask off. There's not much I can do about it. Kila, Ju. Kimosela. Tola. Mango. Indians who were reaching for the mask were halted by a sudden cry from the nearest teepee. The Lone Ranger and Toto turned in that direction and saw a white man approaching with uneven steps. He was haggard and unshaven. He wore only a breech cloth and a poultice of leaves was attached to his back. I'm here! One Indian ran to meet him, threw his blanket over the white man's shoulders and steadied his steps. Look, Kimasabi, that man. He's white. Huh? Sorry. Mana. 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 you. Show me. Mora Kago, my fellow Big Beaver. Oh, Chief Colum brother, Big Beaver. That's the name the Indians gave Dick Norwood. Him got wounded and back. Is your name Norwood? Yes. But how is it that you know my name? And why are you wearing a mask? Don't let my mask disturb you. I know your name because I found your letter in the canteen. You did? Yes, we came here hoping to learn something of your fate. The Indians attacked us. Chief Longlands thought you were the ones who shot me. We didn't. That's what I told the chief. What did you do with the letter you found in the canteen? I took it to your wife. Oh, poor Ella. She and my little daughter. Oh, how did you happen to be here? In as few words as possible, the superintendent of the irrigation dam explained that he had been lying in the teepee, half conscious for weeks, and had just found the strength and clarity of mind to get out. Yes. He went on. Chief Longlands found me the day after I was shot. Also, poor Stark. He buried Stark under a pile of rocks and brought me here. You were fortunate. Somehow the Indians got this bullet out of my back and relieved the pressure that had paralyzed me. As you see, they hung the bullet around my neck as a medicine charm. That was fired from a thirty-eight. I've seen a man who carried such a gun in an open holster. Did you see who shot you? No, but there were two of them. Jim and I had found their footprints on the riverbank where they'd roll logs into the water. Of course, they were cattlemen who wanted to destroy the dam. The Indians are being blamed for the shooting. Unless we can do something to forestall it, this village will be raided by a mob of civilians. You know what that means. I know, I know. Can't the village be moved? The trail could be easily followed. Uh, you tell the chief he wouldn't believe me. All right. Yuga, Fomosi, Tami, Salo, Madeba, Bano. Unade Kimasi? He asks what he should do. Tell him I want him to go to Modoc City with me. He may have to surrender himself as a hostage until we find the real killers. Uh, Yuga. Manikte Olu. Sidu Kanaka Muni. Pu Dareba. Dareba. Huh. Mula. Sego. Kemono. Mino Pero. Go. He doesn't expect to return. Norwood, do you think you're able to ride? Yes. I take it easy. The chief and I will ride fast. Follow us to the town jail. 
My friend Tuttle will ride with you. Very well. Now, if I may have that bullet. Certainly. Here it is. Oh, thanks. Easy to be full Long Lance is ready to ride. They are chanting his death song. Okay. Montenegro! As the Lone Ranger and Chief Long Lance, all differences of creed and color forgotten in the comradeship of the brave, raced out of the village, Modoc City swarmed with armed and excited men. In the jail office where Higgins and Hayes shared the company of some of the more level-headed citizens, the worried sheriff paced the floor. He was saying, Higgins, you talk me into this thing. How can I call it off? You can, sheriff. I wouldn't want to turn that roof old crowd loose on even the peg rules. Listen to him. You've got to let them shoot up the Indians or they'll shoot up the town. Yes, maybe that would be better. Several hours later, the jail began to fill with refugees from the gun-crazy mob. Mrs. Norwood was there with her baby, as were several other mothers. Shivering half-breeds and Mexicans sought safety in the cells. From the street came yells for the sheriff. Come on, sheriff, let's go! What are we waiting for? The old lawman chewed the ends of his horseshoe mustache and groaned. Uh, what am I going to do, Higgins? Just what you plan to do. And you better do it mighty quick. Uh, what? I'm Dan Reed, sheriff. Uh, Some of your volunteers are gathering around the hotel. They say they're going to march on the Indians without you. I can't help it, sir. All I can do is protect the folks in here. You'd better stay. I think I'll mosey up to the hotel myself. Come on, Lane. Oh, just a second. Yeah, it seems like the mob is quieted down, sudden like. Look out the window. Hey, by the stars of Texas. It's a mass man. And he's got an engine chief. That's Long Lance himself. The mass man is covering the hooligans with two six guns. They're giving them a wide pass. He's bringing the chief here. Maybe that'll hold the mob a while, eh? Or maybe he'll get lynched. <laughs> Sheriff, the chief is here as a hostage for the protection of his people. I'm protecting him. Who might you be? Well, that's not important. Well, whoever you are, you sure did me a favor by bringing him in. Not as I can see how you knew about the fix I'm in or how you got him to come. You brought the trouble on yourself. Yes, maybe so. But I figure that the chief knows who the killers are, and I aim to make him tell. He doesn't understand English. Ralph got over it, right? Everybody's closing in on the jail. What do you want to know? Hey, that bullet went through a window. You've got to let them have the red skin. They'll kill us all if you don't. I'll talk to them. Oh, here comes that masked man. Keep your hands frozen and listen to me. There are women and children in the jail. You can't use them to steal that red skin, Father. We're coming in. Then you'll do it over my body and empty guns. Stand back or I'll fire. Flash in, brothers. He can't shoot all of us. Let's push him back. I don't want to be first. Hand over the chief. We'll wipe out his village. Men, the killers aren't Indians. They are men you all know and would be willing to give a fair trial. Chief Long Lance is a witness against them. Another witness is on the way here. Within an hour or so, I promise you the surprise of your lives. Just wait. Maybe there's something in what he says. That's the way he says. All right, masked man. We'll give you an hour to deliver your surprise. Or the Redskins. One hour, boys. Just one hour. Hey, uh, just what did you mean by saying everybody knew they're killers? Just that. Well, I'm getting out of here before the mob gets hostile again. Come on, Lance. Stay where you are. Sheriff, who's running this jail, you or him? Well, it appears like he's doing a pretty good job. You'll hear about this next election day. As slow minutes dragged on toward an hour, the mob again grew restive. Again, there were threats. Then the back door opened. Framed against the gathering shadows was the cadaverous figure of a man who had come back from the dead. He advanced slowly, followed by Toto. The sheriff's jaw sagged. Tim Higgins' eyes turned glassy. Leif Hayes was the first to speak, and his voice was a hoarse whisper. Norwood! Then Norwood's wife threw herself into his arms. She was sobbing. Tim, I told you, he he hasn't even looked at us. Sheriff, the men who wounded Dick Norwood and killed Jim Stark are in this office. Guard the door. Yes, you will. One of them is Tim Higgins. What, why, you can't prove it. Ask Norwood if he can identify me. He can't, but I have something that can. It has no voice, but it speaks louder than words. There's nothing written on it, but it bears your name. What are you talking about? I'll tell you in a minute. 
Sheriff, eh? What kind of a gun do you carry? Me? Well, I got a Colt Nanny model, the same as everyone else around here. Is there anyone here with a new Colt? The kind that takes a self-exploding cartridge. Do any of you know of anyone who has a new model Colt? 38 caliber. Now, now, hold on. Wait, wait a minute. I own a new gun, and it's a 38, just like you said. But that's no proof that I shot Dick Norwood. Here's the bullet that was taken from Dick Norwood's back. Oh, uh, There's only one gun in town that fires this kind of bullet. Higgins, gun. Higgins, I'm taking your gun. You'll take a bullet. Oh, my arm. It's broken. It will heal before you hang. Oh, you can't hang me. Jim did all the shooting. I'll talk. I'll tell everything. It was all on account of that irrigation dam. Yes, I know. I know, too, that other ranchers share in your guilt to some degree. You cattlemen believe that you own the West. But it doesn't belong to any group. It belongs to the people of the United States. Your fate should be a warning to those who put themselves above the law and oppose progress with a gun. Why was it that Higgins didn't hit you when he fired first? <laughs> that, then, continues your Helen. Muna, Robin Sailor. Oh, long lance, say, heart heavy. Cut him cry, kill us. Tell the great chief that he is a brave man and that we bear him no ill will. Give him this for his medicine bag. Here. Uh, long lands. Yuma. Lamago. Tana. Gola. Mochi. Uh, Tato. Dan. Come on. Dick. The masked man and his friends are going. Sheriff, who is the masked man? <laughs> well, I couldn't have rightly said until I saw him give Chief Long Lance his silver bullet. Now I know. He's the Lone Ranger. Created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Enterprises, directed by Charles B. Livingston, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of the Lone Ranger 